evening, chapter 6. If you'll stand with me, please. This is the Word of God, which is without error. It's life-giving, life-changing, and it's what God uses to draw us near to himself. We're going to look at one verse this evening. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And in addition to give us our daily bread, the previous verse, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, Father, thank you again for the Bible. Thank you for each one of your children that are here throughout the facility. And we ask, Lord, that you would just feed us uh, from your word now tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please be seated. You know, God is, of course, not only concerned, but he's also aware of all of our needs before we pray to him. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Jesus said, For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Why then should we pray? If our Father knows what we need, why should we pray? Well, here's a couple of answers. Because prayer is the God-appointed way to meet those needs. Secondly, prayer for our needs to be met prepares us for the proper use of the answer. For example, if we know our need and we voice it to God, trusting him and his provisions, then we will make better use of the answer than if God had forced the answer upon us. We will know it came from him. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus revealed was God's program, which is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that reveals the priority in prayer, looking first to God. There's so much in those few verses. Our Father, all of the body, our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed, or may you be, you are holy, and may you be kept holy uh, in terms of my view of you and my walk with you. Your kingdom, your rule come, and may your will be done on earth right here as it is in heaven. And I was thinking as we were singing here, you know, singing to the Lord is like praying to him. And uh, the Bible says to sing and make a loud noise unto the Lord. And uh, it's a real opportunity to engage in communion with God. Lord, you're a good, good father. You love me. Thank you. It's, it's a wonderful way to praise the Lord. But as we get in now to our give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts, we're getting into the very heart of this Lord's Prayer. The next thing we'll look at is the request for guidance and then the request for protection. With respect to forgiveness, the Christian lives through forgiveness. This is what justification by faith is all about. We're going to look at that in depth later on. You and I could have no life or hope with God had not God's Son, Jesus Christ, come to bear the penalty of sins so we could go free. We would have no hope. We would have no life with God unless Christ had come. We're free now, but as Christians, we still fall short. We still sin, and forgiveness is needed every day. So Jesus, in this part of his model prayer, included a petition whereby God's children ask for forgiveness. It's right between the petition for material provision and the petition for spiritual protection. This is the one and only prayer that Jesus never had to pray, Father, forgive me of my debts, because he never sinned. 
He was never in debt to God. So this evening, where we're headed is, we're going to look at God forgives our debts, God's family forgiveness, God's lesson for us all, and lastly, only the forgiving are forgiven. And I've entitled this message very simply, Forgive Us Our Debts. So to begin with then, God forgives our debts. Why, how should Christians view their sins? Good question. Probably, I don't think I've ever been asked that. How should you view your sins? Well, the scripture presents our sins in many ways. Let me give you a pretty lengthy list fairly quickly. Sin is a horrible force that deceives and destroys. God compares sin to defilement or to destruction and ruin. What dirt is to the body, sin is to the soul. Sin is also pictured as darkness. Sin is a form of bondage. Sin is a burden. Sin is compared to sickness. Sin is lostness. Sin is law-breaking. Sin is a deviation. Sin is a shortcoming. Sin is rebellion. Sin is pollution. And sin is missing the target. Here in the Lord's Prayer, notice what, how Jesus describes our sins. Forgive us our debts. He describes sin as an unpaid debt. We owe a debt to God. Now, in our day, the word sin is barely used in anyone's vocabulary, and it is rarely associated with debt, though Jesus said, and forgive us our debts. So what is a debt? It's a legal obligation, and every sinner is obligated to the Lord to obey his law and his will. You remember in the book of 1 John in chapter 2, uh, John speaks of the commandments that we've been given by the Lord. Really, it sums up the entire law. It's to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then secondly, to love our neighbor just as we would want to be loved and so on. So his will for the New Testament believer is to love God with all that we have. And when we say his will... That's his commandment. It's his will that we love God and that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Our failure to love God and our neighbor is called a debt that we owe to God. When we don't fulfill the calling of God upon our life, we owe a debt to him. That's what sin is. So sin, or falling short of God's commandments, is called a debt that we owe him because we did not live up to his commandments. Thus, falling short of loving God and man as we ought becomes a debt that we owe God. Remember, Jesus, uh, you know, people often say, well, they took Jesus as Savior, now they've taken him as Lord, and I, I don't believe that. Now, you can't splice Jesus up. You know, I'll take half of you now and half of you later. Uh, he is Jesus Christ, the Lord. But if he's the Lord, he even said to his disciples and some others, he said, now, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things that I tell you to do? He is the master. He is our master. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, 12, in this prayer, and in addition to everything else, and forgive us our debts. Sin is a costly debt that keeps accu accumulating painful interest. The Bible reveals in the New Testament three aspects of forgiveness. We want to look at the first type here, and that is the initial and total forgiveness sinners receive 
when they put their trust in Jesus Christ and are justified before God. So when you as a sinner came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and, and you repented, you turned to Christ and you, you put your faith in him, you received him as your savior, you received from God a final or a total forgiveness and God declared you to be justified. Justification means that God now views the sinner who has trusted in Christ just as if he had never sinned. Now think about that. The person who has come to Christ and is therefore justified before God, when God looks at you, he literally sees you just as if you'd never sinned. We don't see ourselves that way. But we're not called to see ourselves the way we see ourselves. We're called to see ourselves the way God sees us. Let me ask you, in case I haven't convinced you, what did Jesus do with your sins? What did God do with your sins? Did he put them in a little box and he kind of looks into them every once in a while? Oh, Danny, uh, listen, what about that? No. As we're going to see later, God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And Christ paid for our sins. They're gone. So when God sees you in Christ, who is perfect, he is the righteousness of God, he sees you just as if you had never sinned. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Behold, if, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation, a new creature. Behold, all th old things have passed away. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're a brand new creature. Look with me in Romans chapter 4 for just a minute here. Paul penned the book of Romans as you're turning there, which explains what justification is. It's the greatest, probably the greatest letter in the New Testament. It's 16 chapters. The first 11 chapters deal with this one doctrine, the doctrine of justification by faith. And you can read that 11 chapters and, and learn quite a bit. But we're just looking into a little portion of his teaching on justification, starting in Romans 4.20, speaking of Abraham, who had received a promise from God. In 4.20, he, Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So he was believing God, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. When Abraham believed God, God then accounted that to him for righteousness or justification. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Justification, I was speaking with our men's group on Monday, and by the way, men, you're sure welcome to come every Monday night, 5.30 to about, oh, I guess 12.30 at night, we're long study, no, it's still 7.30 or so. Uh, we have dinner, and what we're doing right now is going through the basic doctrines of the Bible which may sound, well, it's a basic, well, listen, the basic doc, the, actually, I don't even think the word basic applies. It's the doctrines of the Bible, the teachings of the Bible. And this coming Monday, we're going to look at the doctrine of eternal security. And we take our time with it. Uh, people ask questions, and we try to answer them together. But with respect to the doctrine of justification, this is something, this is a word that you should, and a doctrine that you should be very familiar with because you are justified. God looks at you just as if you'd never sinned. Well, what is it? How does it work? 
Well, it has two components to it. First of all, your sins have been removed from you and placed on Jesus Christ, who then paid the full price for your sins. Secondly, God has imputed, not a word we use very often, or ascribed to you, or clothed you with, or put on your account the righteousness of Christ. So he's laid upon him the sins of us all. That's where our sins went. And then God has imputed to us the righteousness of Christ. So when he sees us, it's just as if we'd never sinned, and he sees us just as righteous as Jesus is. I'm telling you, if we could really tap that doctrine down into our brains and into our heart and really meditate on it and, and get a good grip on it, it should change our everyday life. God, you see me, <laughs> I'm always remembering what I did. <laughs> you see me as if I'd never sinned. Not only that, but I'm, I am as accepted by you as Christ is. That you can't be any more accepted by God than, than Jesus is. Would that be true? It's true. So Colossians 2.12, let me read it, says this, buried with him in baptism, that's spiritual baptism into the body, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive or regenerated you together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses. The word forgiveness could be put in a commercial or a business metaphor. It would mean this. God has canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. The Bible pictures sin as a debt that somebody has to pay. I have a stack of debts that I'm working on. I'm sure you have some. We don't think of our sins that way. If we did, we'd probably have like, we'd need five counters. <laughs> you know, put all of our, but you'd see what I'm saying. Our sins are a debt to God. And if we don't pay our bills on time, five days later, boom, 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 hello. And if it's an insurance company, then when you file a claim, it's, we're sorry, we can't talk to you for 30 days. <laughs> but we'll talk to you in five days if you don't pay your bill. This is why I'm running for public office to change the, in the insurance world. But the Bible pictures sin as a debt that somebody has to pay. The good news is that Jesus Christ paid the price for all debts or sins when he died on the cross and rose again. Ephesians 1.7 says, in him... We have redemption, or he's purchased us through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh like you used to, but you're now walking according to the Spirit. You're born again. So there's no condemnation. We've been forgiven. Our debt has been paid. It's been wiped out. The verb forgiven or canceled literally means wiped out or blotted out. And it's the picture of an ancient banker writing off the amount of the debt written on the sheet of papyrus that they used. King David and the apostle Peter use these same images of blotted out or wiped out in talking about forgiveness. For example, in Psalm 51.1, David said this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. In Psalm 51, verse 9, he said, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Peter, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 19, said, repent, therefore, and be converted 
that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. David used another picture of sin, uh, of sin being wiped out. I love this. In Psalm 103, verse 12, he said this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, think of the globe. You can measure the distance be from the North Pole all the way down to the South Pole, couldn't you? But you cannot measure the distance between East and West. It's a beautiful image of our sins being taken away. In Jesus' day, the Jews, upon hearing this blotted out, taken away, would immediately think of the annual Day of Atonement where the high priest would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat, it was called, and he would confess the sins of Israel, and then the goat was taken away into the wilderness, never to be seen again. They are gone away. The Greek word forgive means to send away. God has sent our sins away. John 1.29, John the Baptist, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said to his disciples, behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the Old Testament, the blood of animal sacrifices only covered the sins of the Israelites. But the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross removes the sins of the whole world. Um, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, John says, For we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who died not only for our sins, the apostles, but he died for the sins of the whole world. Now, people can make a big mistake at this point. They'll say, well, he died for the sins of the whole world. I'm forgiven. No, no, no. He died for the sins of the whole world, but it is only made effective when a person repents and believes in him. That's why the unpardonable sin is not believing in Christ. God has forgiven you for all of your sin. Let's pretend you're all unbelievers. I'm glad you're not, but let's pretend you are. I could say to you, God has forgiven everybody's sins here, and if you will now trust in Christ, that forgiveness will come to life in you. You're going to be justified. But if there's somebody here who says, I'm not going to come to Christ, I don't believe in him, well, if God's already forgiven you of every sin, then that's the only sin that he can't forgive you of. It's the sin of unbelief. It's a wonderful thing to get through in your mind. 1 John 4.14 says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. This is the Apostle John and the other apostles. We've seen him. And the word seen doesn't mean we saw him, you know, going to the cafe. Saw him walk over there. It says, we looked at him. We gazed upon him. We were with him for three and a half years. We watched him whenever he was performing miracles. We watched him as he taught us. We followed him. We looked at him. We've seen him. And we testify to you that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Now, once we have trusted Jesus as our Savior, we are forgiven and we are declared what? Starts with a J. We've been talking about it. We are declared to be justified in him. And at that moment, God the Father proclaims their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So not only are they gone, but God who knows everything, who is omniscient, am I going too fast? Okay. 
Well, then let me speed up. Okay, I'll do a speed talker. You won't get anything out of the whole message. Don't listen to speed preachers, okay, because you go, whoo. What did he talk about? I don't know. <laughs> it was good, I think. <laughs> I don't know what he said, though. But God, who is omniscient, he's never learned anything. He never forgets anything. He never has to be corrected about something that he was a little off on. He knows everything. And somehow within the Godhead, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And perhaps it's not just a, a fact that the Godhead was able to do because nothing is impossible with God, but most likely it's because the Father realizes the Son, all of their sins were put on him. Every sin was put on him, and they've been paid for. It's an over and done with matter with God. So not only does God see you as if you had never, just as if you had never sinned, imagine. Now, in a real quick snapshot, think about all the sin you committed. Okay, that's it. Don't think any more than that. It's a lot. God sees you just as if you'd never sinned, and I don't even remember your sins. How wonderful is that? How wonderful is that? So initial forgiveness, that's the first kind of forgiveness, is total. It's final in the sense that it's a, you're justified once and forever. You don't become justified and a little more justified tomorrow. It's a once and over and done with. Uh, it's what God does to you. So this initial forgiveness is total. It's final forgiveness, and it secures your eternal destiny. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. So that's a quick look at God forgives our debts. Let's look a little further now at God's family forgiveness. God's family forgiveness. Now, we've just enjoyed learning about what God has done with our sins, but there is a problem. And there's a lot of confusion that arises when believers start talking about and thinking about confessing their sins to God and being forgiven. We're talking about believers now. In fact, we talked about this just Monday night. It spurred about an hour's worth of discussion. It was wonderful. Well, listen to this now. If Christ's death atoned for all sins, which past, present, and future, as it did, and if God's verdict justifying the believer, believing sinner which means I accept you as righteous for Jesus' sake, and it is eternally valid as it is, why should the Christian mention his daily sins to God at all? It's a very good question. If he's forgiven me of my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins, and he's declared me to be totally acceptable, he's forgiven me of everything. Why should I confess sins to him on a daily or whatever basis? Well, I believe the answer to the problem is this. It lies in distinguishing between God as your judge and God as your father. Remember, we're talking about God's family forgiveness. Bet distinguishing God as God as your judge or God as your father. And it's a distinction between, it includes being a justified sinner and an adopted son. You are justified by God. You also have been adopted as his child. Ephesians 1, about verse um, 5 says that. He adopted us as his own children and, it's, and I love this. He says, because it is what he wanted to do. Imagine that. You know, when people go to an adoption agency, they want to adopt this child or that child. And they can, you know, they want, it, they want to do that. Well, God wanted to adopt you. So 
we're justified, but we're also adopted children. So what does all that mean? Well, God as judge declares a repenting, believing sinner to be justified, but God as father looks upon the same person as an adopted son. It's now, we're, it's moving along here. This second type of forgiveness is called family forgiveness. We're in God's family. We're his children. And we're talking about the problem, if God has forgiven all of my sins, why should I be confessing them? Well, the Lord's Prayer in its entirety is a family prayer. This was for the people who were following Christ, in which God's children address him as what? Our Father who art in heaven. And though we have daily failures, sins, these failures, these sins, these debts, they do not cancel out or annul our justification. That justification is a once-for-all declaration. There's nothing you can do. God's going to say, you, you, you've just done too much. That would never happen. He has forgiven you. He's declared you to be righteous. Romans chapter 8 says, He's, who, um, who is he that condemns? It is God that justifies. God is the judge of all the earth. He's the supreme court judge, if you will. It's the final word. Once the supreme court rules, it's over. What they rule on is done. When God has declared you righteous and justified, it's a fact but you're also his child. And we do sin, don't we? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, if any man says he has no sin, he is a, starts with an L, ends with an R, a liar. We do uh, spelling classes here for those of you that are new. <laughs> it's a way to help us think a little bit. If anyone says he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. So our sinning doesn't cancel out our justification, that's all. Justification is something that God declares to be true about the person who repents and believes, and it never changes. God will forever see that repenting, believing sinner just as if he never sinned. When the adopted child of God sins, what happens? It breaks or disturbs their fellowship with God. Now, let's take an example of parents and children. If a child is misbehaving and is rebelling and is refusing to do what he or she ought to do, it's not a happy time, is it? And generally what happens is the child is sent to his or her room. And things will not be right between the parents and the child until the child comes out and says, I'm what? I'm sorry. Well, things will not be right between us and our father till we have said, I'm sorry. And ask him to forgive the ways in which we have let him down by sinning. Remember, holy Holy, holy is our God. 1 John 1, 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive or send away, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. So the point is this, when the justified, adopted child of God sins and confesses their sins, they are like the returning prodigal coming home to their father. Sins are so forgiven, it's as if they were never committed. So God forgives us, God's family forgiveness, and going a little further, we have God's important lesson for us. And it's this, Christians must be willing to examine themselves 
the discipline of self-examination is distasteful to our pride, but it is necessary. Self-examination is necessary because our Holy Father in heaven will not turn a blind eye to his children's failings as some human parents often do, and so unwisely. 1 Corinthians 11.28 says this in the teaching on the Lord's Supper, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. The word examine means to test, to approve, to allow, to discern, to prove, or to try. In other words, if we're going to be confessing our sins, we, we need to be uh, examining ourselves. So what God knows about our sins, we need to know also, so that we can repent and ask forgiveness for whatever sin has taken place. God has a big eraser. That's the lesson. That's the lesson that God has for us. Last thing we want to look at is this. Only the forgiving are forgiven. Only the forgiving are forgiven. Those who hope for God's forgiveness, said Jesus, must be able to tell him that they too have forgiven their debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Look with me, please, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. This is after the Lord's Prayer. It's the only issue in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus says something else about. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, only the forgiving are forgiven this is not a matter of earning forgiveness, as we're going to see. Forgiving others is the third kind of forgiveness. There's the final forgiveness at justification. There's the family forgiveness as an adopted child of God. And then there's this third kind of forgiveness. It's the forgiving of other people. Those who live by God's forgiveness have the joy the responsibility and the blessing of imitating God's forgiveness. The believer whose only hope is that God will not hold his failures against him gives up his right to hold others' failures against them. Well, God, I know you forgive me, but I don't forgive him. You know what he's done? Matthew 7, 12 says this, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It sums up the entire Old Testament. Matthew 18, 35, That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your hearts. Now remember, our Father forgives us our sins. We are his children. We're being conformed into the image of Christ. We have his nature within us. Children act like their parents. They have their parents' DNA in them. Sometimes I feel so stupid when I'm talking to somebody and I look at their kids or even if they're little or old and say, man, he really looks like you. Well, duh. That's, yeah, that's your child. Well, he even has the same inflection in his voice. Duh. He even walks like you. Well, that's because he's your child. Well, God is a forgiving God. We are his children. He expects us to be forgiving of other people. 
Jesus on three occasions dealt forcefully with the sin of an unforgiving spirit. I wish we had the time to go to Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50, but let me just tell you quickly, there was a Pharisee there named Simon who came in, and there was a woman who was weeping at Jesus' feet and was cleaning his feet with her hair. The Pharisee came in, he saw no sin in himself, but he was quick to see a great deal of sin in the woman who was weeping at the feet of Jesus. It's important to understand that forgiving others is not the reason God forgives us, nor is it a device we use to earn his forgiveness. Forgiveness by God is a matter of grace and mercy, not law and works. There is no reason for God to forgive us except for his great love. That's why he forgives us. I don't forgive others. To, if I don't forgive others, I make myself a judge like Simon the Pharisee in Luke 7. The woman, I think, had been a prostitute. And he came in and he couldn't believe what's going on here with this woman. He saw the sin in her, but he wasn't there willing to forgive her. So if I don't forgive other people and I see them and I don't forgive them, I'm making myself a judge like Simon did in Luke 7. God forgives us for the sake of his son and we must forgive others for the same reason, for Jesus' sake. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Now, we've all heard this little statement, forgive and forget, haven't we? Forgive and forget. Charles Spurgeon said, forgive and forget. And he said, when you, when you bury a mad dog, don't leave his tail above the ground. Forgive and forget. Some closing thoughts. If we don't forgive, that unforgiving spirit may lead us into further sin. Galatians 6.1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. There, you know, sin brings so many hurts and wounds, but there is a beautiful promise in the Old Testament that helps to heal the wounds of the believer who has disobeyed the Lord and has suffered for it and then confess their sins and they've been restored. It's in the book of Joel chapter 2 verse 25. Let me read it. God says, I will repay for the years the locusts have eaten. Now in Joel's day, the land had suffered a devastating invasion of locusts, excuse me. Locusts, of course, take everything up. The locusts were ju God's judgment on the sinning people. Then God sent the prophet Joel, and he pleaded with the people to repent and to return to him, promising that God would forgive them and even compensate them for what they had lost. God can cleanse and God can restore. I will repay for the years the locusts have eaten. So often, people who have sinned, they allow that past sin to define their life in the present. I'm that guy who did that. I'm that girl who did, I'm not that girl, but you know, I'm that girl who did that. That's true. But God can cleanse you. And if you've repented, you've been restored to God. And he's cleansed you. 
And he says, I will repay you. You caused the trouble. That's why the locusts came. That's why all of the trouble came into your life. But I'm going to repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten. On Sunday evening, May 30th, 1886, Pastor Charles Haddon Spurgeon, from that very text, Joel 2.25, I will repay for the years the locusts have eaten, he said to his congregation at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England, quote, lost years can never be restored literally. Time once passed is gone forever. You cannot have back your time. But there is a strange and beautiful way in which God can give back to you the wasted blessings, the unripened fruit over which you mourned. The fruits of wasted years may be yours. The fruits of wasted years may yet be yours. And he closed by saying, all things are possible to him that believeth. That is our God who is a forgiving God. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are, de who, who are our debtors, those who've sinned against us. Father, thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for the Lord's the Sermon on the Mount, Lord Jesus. You actually preached this whole sermon. These very words in Aramaic came out of your lips, and it would have been Abba, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so here we are now, Lord, thousands of years later, learning how to pray. Jesus, you said, pray in this manner. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Father, thank you for teaching us how to pray. We love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.